Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. It is February 7th, 2015, and this is episode 25, Knitters for Life. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman, <laughs> and I cannot pull that off. <laughs> I've officially gotten too old to pull that kind of stuff off. That's spelled K-N-I-T-T-A-S for all of you who are officially over the hill like I am. And don't tell me I'm not over the hill. You don't know. I am not in my 20s. I am not in my 30s, despite my baby face. All right. What? Why do I feel the need? I have this compulsion to clean my glasses right before I start, right as I start recording. Okay, let's start with some announcement type things. First of all, I... Uh, I wanted to give out a number of thank yous to um, several of you. First of all, I have realized recently that I have fallen down on the job with keeping up with the iTunes reviews that a number of you have been leaving. Went back and looked, and I think it's been since December that I thanked those of you who have left reviews there. So to Gail Nitz, Becky DJD, SHQ09, Karen and Dolly and Mel Nitz, thank you so much for leaving those very kind reviews that you did. And um, I just, I realized that I just kind of wanted to say thank you in general to, uh, there are so many of you who have either sent me private messages or on Ravelry or Instagram or through various ways have told me how much you really like the podcast and how much you appreciate it. And I just wanted to let you know that that really means a lot to me. I um, there are weeks like this where I think about, oh gosh, I have to record the podcast. <laughs> and I just think, oh. And it's not that I don't like doing it. I love recording the podcast. It's just that, you know, like everybody, I'm really busy and having one more thing that I need to do just sometimes feels like, you know, somebody just put another stone in your backpack. So... Right about the time that I start to feel like that, one of you will contact me and I think, man, <laughs> that is just, that is just the best. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I want to give a special thank you to Pat this week. I will not call her out on what she did, but she did a very nice thing for me this week. An ongoing thing, which I really, really appreciate. Thank you, Pat. That was very kind of you and thoughtful. Uh, more updates. I have, um, news for you about Knitting Daily TV. That was my professional TV face. <laughs> I did not do that on Knitting Daily TV. This is the lovely Vicki Howell. And this is the show, Knitting Daily TV, which is put out, uh, by Interweave. And as you recall, I am going to be on episode... 1408. Well, maybe you don't recall that specifically, but I am on episode 1408 called Playtime Knits in, in this upcoming, or actually I think the season has already started. Um, this is the DVD, which uh, they sent me because a minute. And, uh, but you can get, you can also get this on Andrew Wu's website. This includes um, episode 1401 to 1413, which I think may be just like the first half of the season, maybe, or maybe it's the whole season. I'm not quite entirely certain. Anyway, the main thing I wanted to say is that this will be airing, my episode will be airing on Tuesday, March 17th, and uh, which I believe is St. Patrick's Day. At least it is in Austin. I'm assuming that the schedule is the same in other parts of the country. Um, if you don't have PBS, which you know generally means you're not in the United States, uh, then they do have individual episodes for download on Interweave's site, if you ever want to take a look at it. Um, and I believe, no, I think I'm just making that up. I was going to say, I think eventually they start putting them up on YouTube, but I think I'm just making that up. <laughs> but in one of you, oh, who was it? It was, oh man, I always hate it when people do this and now here I am doing it. Looking stuff up on the computer, and my computer's not working, so forget it. But one of you very kindly wrote to tell me that there was an ad for Knitting Daily in 
this month's or this quarter's interweave knits the magazine and then it was in the picture looking fancy with all my fancy eyebrows and my fancy hair and my fancy makeup not today <laughs> today i got my wet hair and my no makeup um but yeah anyway as you can tell i am a little giddy about appearing on this show and i actually do not seem nervous even to myself which kind of amazes me and there are lots of really great people in this season including um andy smith who is the one designer who designed synchronicity that's that uh two color cable collection that i showed you last time she is also in this season i think a few episodes before i am so that's cool um i also got this week i got my stitch definition business cards that i designed Woo! Yeah, i did a little logo get it it's like <laughs> don't you love when people say that get it it's a uh camera lens and then it's bringing the stitches into focus because that's our logo or i mean our motto bringing your knitting designs into focus and then there's our information on the back, me and Ann Podlasek doing our photography, graphic design, editing thing for people in the fiber industry. <laughs> so I'm going to keep half of these and send the other half to Ann. I got some stuff that I need to mail to her. So I was pretty excited. I don't know. There's something about, isn't it? There's something about getting business cards that makes you feel official, you know, like, oh, now it's really happening. <laughs> It's like, you know that word reification? It's like it makes, reification means when something that's, I think it means when something that's abstract is made tangible or real. It's like that. Business cards are reifying entities. <laughs> Speaking of that, I wanted to mention a couple of upcoming events where I will be just in case, in the hopes that I will see some of you there. The most recent one, or the one that's coming up the soonest, is uh, DFW Fiberfest. DFW being Dallas-Fort Worth, which is about three and a half hours from me. Um, I will be attending that as a civilian. In other words, I will not be teaching, although I am going to help out uh, Anne Podlesack, my business partner for Stitch Definition, is also the dyer behind Willy Wonka Fibers, and she is going to be vending there. So I will um, be helping her out in her booth on Saturday and probably part of Sunday too. So please do come by and, and, uh, introduce yourself. Um, I will also be at the podcaster meetup, which I believe is on Saturday afternoon. I don't have the details on that yet, or I just forgot to look them up is really what I mean. But, uh, DFW Fiberfest is a really, really good show. Uh, it is one of the best organized shows that I've been to and um, super fun, lots of vendors, great classes. This year especially is going to be great because it's their 10th anniversary, I believe, and they're bringing back all of their big teachers from the previous 10 years, or a lot of them anyway, to give talks and classes. And so it's going to be quite the hullabaloo. So that is in March, and then in May, I'm going to be at TNNA, which is the, which always makes the 13-year-old boy inside me giggle. <laughs> Anyways, TNNA stands for the National Needle Arts Association, and uh, they have, it's basically the trade show for the fiber industry, including needlepoint and embroidery and uh, weaving, I mean, really the whole gamut. Huge show. It's in Columbus, back in Columbus again in May. And um, yeah, it's where, basically where I'm going to go to schmooze and talk up Stitch Definition because that is where we are officially launching it. We are taking clients now, um, but we're not officially launching the business until May. So that is pretty cool. And then, also incredibly exciting. I, uh, I can now tell you that I will, well, I could have told you before that I'm going to be at Arkansas Fiber Fest in September because I always go to Arkansas Fiber Fest. I love teaching there. I love going there. It's a wonderful show. And, um, but I can now tell you because it's a word is officially out that I am going to be the keynote speaker at the Arkansas Fiber Fest. 
I still can't believe that. Because here's the thing, and this is not even remotely intimidating, she said sarcastically. The keynote speaker last year was Stephanie Pearl McPhee. Perhaps you have heard of her. <laughs> no, I don't feel any pressure whatsoever. None at all. <laughs> no, I am really, I'm, I'm quite honored that they asked me. Um, I'm a bit flummoxed and flabbergasted that they asked me, but I am quite honored. And I am already thinking about what I'm going to talk about. I'm actually thinking, because my inclination would be to do a kind of personal essay, slightly comedic sort of thing. But again, you know, that's, that's, Seventy Pearl McPhee is kind of the queen of that sort of thing. And to hold, I don't know, to, to, to basically give a talk in the same genre and hold it up for comparison just really seems like setting myself up for disaster. So actually what I'm thinking about doing is doing something cool about um, Arkansas and the history of wool and knitting there, which I know that may sound dull on the face of it, but I am going to make it interesting because that was my job for 13 years, right? Was taking very tired, very bored college students and making them think that the history of science was fascinating or at least worth getting out of your pajamas for, or maybe not because they all wore pajamas. Uh, <laughs> wow, <laughs> that was quite a little mini rant. My plan is to do a kind of episodic history of quirky little stories in Arkansas's history of knitting and fiber and make it fun and interesting. That's what I'm thinking about doing. We shall see. I may fall back on the, <laughs> on the personal essay idea because I do. I like that. I like that style. Um, let's see. What else do we need to talk about? We have a couple of giveaway bits to address. One of them is the giveaway from last week. This lovely little package of Australian Superfine Merino. Uh, if you remember two, or if you've seen last week's episode, uh, two balls of, well, I'll get it out. What the heck? I'm not going to apologize for the crinkling. It's just going to happen. You probably get tired of hearing it from people. All right. So there's a dark blue that's really almost a gray and this lovely vibrant turquoise. Uh, and there is also inside the package the pattern for this simple, cute pom-pom cat. And of course you can make any, whatever you want with it, but it's nice to have, it's nice not, if you don't want to have to think about it, it's nice not to have to. So that, I asked you to answer the question, pom-pom, pro or against? I think I phrased it better than that, but the answers were really funny. Um, a lot of them, there were definitely pro pom-pom and there were definitely anti pom-pom. And then there were people who were kind of in between like, uh, I like them on some people, but you would never catch me dead wearing them. Or, and this is what our winner said, I'm, I'm another in the camp of love pom-poms, but hate to make them. Like, I think they're cute, but I don't like making them or I make them and they don't turn out right. So the winner in this case is, was post number 25. I did the random number generator thing. And that is Marie, who is normally abnormal on Rav. Great Ravelry name. And uh, so Marie, when you see this, if you will uh, get in touch with me either at, through Ravelry, at, send me a PM to Dark Matter Knits or, um, or send me an email at darkmatternits at gmail.com and I'll need your full name, so your first name and last name, and your mailing address. And I will mail you this nice little package here for which... Thank you, Click Heaton and Stitchcraft Marketing. It's nice that you send that. While we're on the subject of that, 
uh, there was some really interesting discussion about branding and this company in particular on the Ravelry thread. So I, you know, always put up on Ravelry a a new thread for a discussion about the episode. And uh, there were some really interesting, I mean, I always kind of give a question for people to respond to just in case you kind of want to chime in, but you don't really know what to say. So, um, but by the way, don't feel like you have to answer that question. It's more just there to give you something to say if you want it. Uh, but my question for this week was, you know, have you ever seen any, like, what is the kind of branding that really gets to you? What have you seen in yarn branding that always kind of tugs at you, that really works on you? And, uh, and a lot of the, a lot of you pointed out, or, or the comments all seem to kind of group into that you either liked um, branding that where the, the packaging was really good, where the yarn had been especially well put together. And the, the example that someone gave that I thought was a good one was um, when I think at Lollipop Yarns does this, where self-striping yarn is wound up into a ball so that, you know, each time the color changes, they change the direction of the way the yarn is wrapped. So it gives this cute little kind of candy look to it, which is incredibly, incredibly time consuming to do that. Uh, but very effective. And um, so the, there's the kind of the great packaging angle that a lot of you mentioned. And then a lot of you also talked about the great story. So if there's a really good story behind the yarn, then it'll get to you. So that was very interesting. Um, one of you pointed out to me that, uh, well, gently, Kay from, Kay who is soy latte from Bendigo, which is in Australia, pointed out to me that I mispronounced Wangarada, it is supposed to be, not Wangarada. And I will just say in my defense, I should have looked it up, but I will just say in my defense that here in the US, you don't default to Wang as a pronunciation unless you're really sure. <laughs> Again, there's a little 13, there's a 13 year old boy living inside me. And he has a very naughty sense of humor. I'll just leave it at that. And finally, on the Rav thread about this episode, uh, Bookaholic13 told us about a very smart blog post about this yarn on the blog uh, Needle and Spindle, which is written by Rebecca, who lives in Melbourne, so another Australian. And uh, I'll put a link to the, the blog post in the show notes, and I don't want to... It's a, it's, a, it's a long and very interesting post, and I really encourage you to read it, but I just want to give you some sense of what she talks about. She starts out by saying that she wanted to knit a hat or, you know, knit an accessory from her stash. And so she pulls out these two balls of DK weight yarn and they're by completely different producers, but she thinks, yeah, they'll, they'll be fine together. And I'll just do this color work hat. And, um, and she starts thinking about the fact that one of the yarns is this undyed Gotland yarn. So it's a, you know, a fairly, a relatively obscure breed it's not merino um it's not bfl etc and uh it's from a small fiber farm called granite haven and then the other ball of yarn is this cleck heaton super fine merino that i just showed you so she, then she goes off on this amazing riff about which is really the entire rest of the blog post about how these yarns are like david and goliath um with and here i'll quote quote the piece. She has this whole, you know, sort of biblical morality play about the yarns. Um, Granite Haven is David from a small farm, very simply processed, unlabeled, and rather humble. The Merino is Goliath with the might of a large company behind it, teams of experts involved in everything from a new spinning method to its label design. So she starts off with this concept of the Cleckheaton being this kind of uh, commercial behemoth. And then Interestingly, she ends up calling the company and I think she ends up, she's calling them for some little bit of information, but ends up talking to one of their reps for a pretty good long time about their story and about how they're supporting farmers and what's happened to Merino farmers over the last number of years. And, and she kind of starts to not have more sympathy for, her, but just kind of starts to see the, what Cleck Heaton is doing as at least 
morally more complex than just, you know, the giant to be knocked down. And it just, it goes on from there. I, like I say, I don't want to, you really just have to read the whole thing to get a full sense of the, the quality of it. But um, yeah, she goes on to talk about, she decides it's not David and Goliath, it's Thorin and his oak branch from The Hobbit. <laughs> It's, it's great. It's great. And strictly on the basis of that post alone, I've decided I've got to keep reading this blog because it is just, I love her. She's got very smart, thoughtful flights of fancy in this post. So that's the Claquette Merino. The other thing, the other giveaway that we have is a new one that I'm going to be posting on to Ravelry this week. And that is... Someone you, if you are a podcast fan, you have encountered this woman's lovely stuff before. This is a bag from Bags by Awesome Granny, who is Darlene. And uh, I actually did her logo for her, which is how I first encountered her. She is a very nice person to work with, and she designs, obviously, beautiful bags. She let me pick which one I wanted to share with you. And she will, when we pick the winner on the next episode, she will send you one exactly like this. And I want to show you, it's a very nicely made bag uh, with a little, oh gosh, my hands aren't working. This nice little strap that you can put over your wrist if you like, or attach to a bag. Um, there's a little um, hook on here that has, you know, some nice little messages on it. Very pretty fabric inside and comes with a little smaller pouch that you could use for notions and I mean it's like Matryoshka dolls and is that how you say it <laughs> Russian dolls um, there's a sweet little well, here let me get this out there is a little zipper pull in here that you can then if you like. You can either use it as a stitch marker, a giant stitch marker, or you can attach it to the zipper as a zipper pole. And there's the little logo I designed for her. Bags by Awesome Granny. And here's her card. She's on Etsy. And she told me to tell you that she is uh, has very nicely given us a discount code that we can use. Um, let me find it. It is DMK10, so capital all capital letters, DMK10, and that will give you 10% off of any orders through April. So thank you very much, Darlene. Um, like I say, I'm going to open up a thread for... Uh, to enter to win this bag. And I'm going to ask you to answer the question, what is another good use for knitting project bags? You can use these for lots of things. And um, I would just like to hear either what you have used them for or what you could use them for. Um, I just, I often think when I look at these bags, you know, I wonder sometimes if people who make knitting project bags, if there's a whole other audience of people that should know about them, you know, that because lots of people would like these bags, right? Use them for all kinds of things. So let me know. I think it'd be interesting for Darlene and other bag makers to know, you know, what are some other ways that you could use these bags? Um, so you'll need to be a member of the group in order to enter. Ooh, sorry. Ow. And uh, one post per person, etc. And I will draw, I'll close down the thread before, I always do it right before I record the next episode, which will be two weeks from now. So that I believe, yes, is all our businessy things. So on to today's topic. I have no review for you today. Um, I kind of got to the end of all of my review stuff and I was thinking about what am I going to talk about this time? And um, suddenly it popped back into my head this uh, funny comment that uh, Joanne, who is uh, J-I-O on Ravelry, J-I-O, G-O? Not sure actually how you pronounce that. 
But uh, Joanne, when she came to Austin a couple of months ago, we met up and she said this funny thing to me. Where she's like, you know, you've mentioned on your podcast that you've been knitting for 30 years. What do you do with all that stuff? You know, like she was, <laughs> which I just thought was so great. I'd never really thought about it that way before. Like if you've been knitting for that long, like how many sweaters and hats and so like, like really how many do, do you need? And uh, she's like, do you end up giving stuff away? Do you end up throwing stuff away? Like what, what happens to all of it? So I thought this, this popped back into my head this week. And I thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be funny to go back and find some of my old, uh, I don't have stuff from 30 years ago, but I have some pretty old stuff that I got out to show you and talk about a little bit. Um, some th old things that I've knit, some old things that I've designed, um, some of my older books and patterns. And I just thought it'd be fun to go back through some of that stuff. So let's start with some of the old stuff that I've knit. And I think this is actually what made this pop into my head. It's been, you know, it's been chilly here. It's not that cold right now. It's actually in the 60s. Uh, okay, that's not cold at all. But it's been, it has been chilly here for Texas. And so I've been wearing my hand-knitted socks a lot. And I noticed um, there's this pair that I like to wear. These are... I, I did not look up the yarns or the patterns for any of these things, sorry. Uh, but this is just a, you know, a vanilla pair of socks that I made out of uh, one of those sock blanks. So I don't know if you've seen these, but they're, they're basically fingering weight yarns that have been knitted up on a machine into a flat that's usually about maybe six inches wide or maybe eight inches. And, um, and then it's dyed in the flat and then you unravel it and knit that up. So it makes this cool striping effect. The thing that I thought was funny that I hadn't noticed was how threadbare these socks are getting. Whoa. And I don't know, are you gonna be able to see? Oh yeah, you can see it. Look at that. Oh yeah. If you've ever wondered about the literal meaning of threadbare, there it is, baby, right there. <laughs> And it's all over these socks, all over the bottom. This one's especially bad. It's just really coming apart. Any minute now, one of these little babies is going to burst. Yeah, it's barely holding on. And you might say to yourself, oh, it already has. Look, the toe is already, already burst. And you might say to yourself, Elizabeth, what are you doing to your socks? Now I wear these as house socks. I walk around, I work at home. I walk around home all the time with just socks on, which I mean, I have tile floors and seagrass carpeting in some of the rooms. I'm pretty hard on my socks. And um, you might again say to yourself, Elizabeth, why don't you take better care of your socks? Why don't you wear shoes when you're walking around the house? Why don't you, um, why don't you take better care of them? And I will tell you this, since you were talking to yourself, I will answer you back. <laughs> that I just, um, I just want to enjoy them. You know, I don't want to, there are some knitted things that I like to treat as precious, but for the most part, I really enjoy the knitting process. And then once it's done, it's clothes, you know, I'm, I'll be pretty good to it and I'll, you know, I'll, if it's hand wash, I'll hand wash it, etc. But I don't, um, I just, they're not precious in the sense that I don't handle them with kid gloves. I just want to wear them. I just want to enjoy them. I want to wear them all the time. And I don't want to have to tiptoe around. I don't buy stuff that has to be dry cleaned. I don't, I don't buy expensive clothes. You know, I just, I go, and these socks are easily 10 years old. So, you know, if I have to end up throwing them away, which I probably should do right now. <laughs> Done. <laughs> I know, I know I could mend them. I know, but I'm not going to. I'm going to knit new socks because I don't, I want new socks. I don't want, I don't want those. Uh, let me, sh let's see what else have I got over here. I've pulled out a bunch of things. Now, by way of contrast, 
I pulled out another couple of socks that I wanted to show you. This, well, this isn't so much contrast, but just a kind of different version of the same story. This is a pair of socks that I knit based on an interweave knits pattern from, oh, I don't know, sometime in the early 2000s. Lovely pattern, and this was, yeah, really before I knew much about matching up variegated yarns with patterns. It's got this lovely leaf lace thing that's just kind of lost in all of the pooling and the striping and so on. Not really the best matchup of yarn and pattern. And uh, and so I never really liked these very much. And so I've really not taken good care of these. This is a... I don't remember what yarn this is. I think it's Lorna's Laces. And you're really not supposed to machine wash this. And I machine wash it anyway. Because you can see how how ragged the, the soles of the socks have gotten as a result. They're really pilly and um, just you know, kind of washed out. So they're just, they've become kind of utilitarian socks because they just didn't really, they didn't really work. Another pair of utilitarian socks, and I, these are some of the first socks that I ever knit out of a Regia yarn, I think. Maybe an Opal, I'm not sure. But it's one of those, you know, super tough wool yarns that's produced in Germany or Italy. And, um, and I didn't, again, didn't really know what I was doing at the time, so I knitted at a pretty loose gauge. I don't know if you'll, you can really see how floppy it is, but it's, you really ought to knit socks at a pretty dense gauge, and this isn't quite there. But, okay, these socks are at least 15 years old, and, I mean... They felt it a little bit, and they're pilling a little bit, but, dude, these, <laughs> these will survive the nuclear apocalypse. So, it, it definitely, if you want socks that are going to last, get don't get the soft yarns that have no nylon in them, and that are strictly merino, and that are just super soft. Those are not going to last you. Um, I did a pair of socks at a Malabrigo sock that they didn't even last a year. They were just, um, but yeah, those, those Regia and Opal yarns, they last forever. I, I, I'll bet you I could hold this up in 15 years and it would still be <laughs> just the same. Um, I also found something that has survived pretty well, actually, through some some tough times. This little, what is this pattern called? It's an Isolde Teak pattern. Sweet little elephant. And uh, it's very cute. I love his, I love how his uh, arms and legs get kind of bulby at the bottom. And uh, the face is super sweet and doesn't really require any fancy embroidery. It's a really nicely designed pattern. And I knit it out of, um, oh gosh, it's a Rowan yarn. Uh, and I just noticed something has gotten to it. We get carpet beetles here. Oh, carpet beetles. I hate them so much. They're just as bad as moths. These little tiny things and they just eat your wool. They're terrible. Uh, but that's easily fixed. I could definitely patch that up. Um, oh, it's gotten to his... I need to. But yeah, this guy's held up pretty well. I mean, this was, I made this for my son when he was a baby. And, um, you know, so he obviously got a lot of flinging and flopping around, and he still looks pretty good. Another thing for my son's childhood, my son's 10 now, and uh, I made this for him before he was born. Right? <laughs> I don't make stuff like this for him anymore. Would he wear this? No. But this is actually from one of my older books. Baby Knits from Dale of Norway, Soft Treasures for Little Ones. Such a cute book. Uh, and definitely, well, actually, some of the things are fairly simple, uh, but many of them are not. I just want to show you a couple of pictures out of here. I mean, look at this. There's like a whole, like complete layouts. 
in these really sweet patterns. Um, like this one's actually relatively simple. It's just stockinette. There's pants and booties and a little cardigan and a hat. And there's a bonnet and embroidery instructions if you want to make it more girly. And then the one I made, oh, you've got to see this. This is adorable. <laughs> little Fair Isle pants and a sheep sweater, a little matching hat. Oh, Dale of Norway. The one I made is, where are you? I think it's toward the end. Yeah, there it is. Seared all. And it's steeped. This is the first time I ever steeped anything. So because Fair Isle is more easily done in the round, you work it all in a tube and then you cut open the openings for the sleeves and then you cut all the way up the center to open it up as a cardigan. And uh, thankfully my mom helped me with it because I don't think <laughs> I could have done it on my own. But this sweater was magic. It actually fit my son the first year. He, so he was born in July. So he was six months his first winter. It fit him then, you know, as a kind of big jacket. And then it fit him when he was a year and a half as a normal size, like as a outer layer. And then it fit him when he was two and a half as, you know, just an over the shirt layer. Magic. If you ever listened to Cast On, this was years and years ago, I did an essay about this sweater on, uh, on Cast On. Recorded one for them. And I love the little contrasting color band that you do to hide all the ends that get covered up with steak or that get exposed from steaking. I didn't do a very good job sewing the buttons on. They're a little too floppy, but they, they're very sweet little Norwegian. Well, I don't know if they're Norwegian, but they look appropriate on the sweater. And it's got stains on it that I can't get out. And there's a place where the carpet beetles got it. The carpet beetles. Oh, I hate them. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not this one. I could have sworn they had munched a little hole in here somewhere, but I can't find it. So, yeah, I really love... I was very, I was and still am very proud of this little sweater. Um, I also have one of my first designs that I ever did. I've never published this because, why didn't I ever publish this? But I never will, or at least I'm not going to do it in this form because, check this out. I did it as a baby sweater and I wanted to do something with an unusual construction. So it's actually done on the bias all the way around like this in one fell swoop. I think it's a really cool idea, but it is wildly misshapen. <laughs> I don't think most babies as squishy as they are, are this wide and squat. <laughs> so I think it's an idea worth exploring again, but I would need to re refigure out the short rows in order to make it a shape that would actually fit a human being. <laughs> um, what else did I pull out? Oh, I was going to pull out some of my oldest yarn, but that's not really that exciting. I have pulled out my oldest Interweave Knits magazine. This is from fall of 2000. So I know, actually, that is not even close to the oldest one that I have because I started buying Interweave when I was in grad school in 95. Uh, but this is one of my favorites. And you can see I've got it all. This is well before Ravelry. I've got a bunch of things tagged in here that I wanted to make, like Ann Bud has her mitten pattern in here that I think ended up being in that uh, Knitter's Handy Book of Patterns. It's basically like the prototype for that. And, oh, there's a really sweet little kids pullover in here that I was probably thinking about making for my kid. And um, some hats and 
yeah, just some really, really great stuff that really hasn't gone out of style. I was going to see if I could find, for some reason I had marked only women's or uh, kids stuff. Oh, look at this coat. I would never make this, but man, you got to admire the work that went into that. What's that called? Nikki Epstein. It's the Enchanted French Traveling Cape. I loved when Pam Allen was the editor of this magazine. Those were my favorite years. Yeah, really nice, really nice stuff. I need to go back through some of these magazines and see if there's anything in here that I want, want to make. Um, and I also pulled out this, this isn't really something I've had for so long. Well, yeah, I've had this stuff for, these are for about eight years. Uh, but I have a friend who, in Kim, who is an art historian, and she has a friend whose mom had passed away, and she knew that I knitted, and so Betsy sent me all of her mom's old knitting patterns. <laughs> oh, man. There's some great stuff in here, and I have not yet made anything out of this, but I definitely want to. This is one of my favorites. Minerva Hand Knits for Men in the Service, 25 cents, volume 65. Let's see, what, or 62, sorry. Let's see what we've got here. Oh my Lord. <laughs> Woo! Oh, look at that. That man is uncomfortable in that vest. Oh gosh, there's just such, the photographs in here are fantastic. Really um, classic designs. Um, very uncomplicated. It looks like Gene Kelly. Well, he's not as handsome as Gene Kelly, but he's kind of got that same starry-eyed look on his face. Some gloves and, oh, it's just fantastic. Um, there are also, oh wait, what year is this from? That's what I wanted to look up. 1941, during World War II. Fantastic. There is also, hold on. Oh yeah, this is a good one too. An old Bernat pattern book. Number 41, 50 cents. Man, um, what year is this from? It doesn't say, but I'm thinking this is probably the, either the 40s or the early 50s. Oh, come on, tell me what year you're from. Don't know. Ah, 1954. Okay, mid-50s. Isn't that cute? I couldn't pull that off because I'm too pear-shaped, but if I weren't, I would totally wear that. Um, yeah, there's some truly horrible stuff in here, too, but... Very cute vintage. Well, it wasn't at the time vintage styling. It was very modern, but... Oh, no! Dropping things everywhere. And then... I mean, there are just tons of tons of great stuff in here including some old Vogue knitting magazines I'll show you one of those in a moment and also these typewritten patterns that you know clearly got passed around from person to person this is for a rabbit it's just so sweet sorry let me pick this up off the floor here's one for uh, winter sport fashions <laughs> ding, 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 ding. wait let me find I gotta find the Vogue knitting one because I'm sure you would love seeing what an old Vogue. Here it is. I think there's just one in here, but it's pretty fantastic. Vogue knitting from fall 1957. That's right. Boom. Let's look through it, shall we? How to mend knitted garments. 
they've got basic knitting instructions at the beginning. Um, here's an ad for U.S. savings bonds. Pay you higher interest faster. Okay, and then here are some of the designs all in black and white photography. Actually, still pretty, pretty wearable today. Oh, here's some that are in color. I love that. And yeah, very actually really quite fashionable. I want to check on the sizing. There's some men's stuff, there's some children's stuff, there's machine knits, interestingly. Um, okay, the lace dress now, let's not do that. Evening blouse. The directions are for size 12. Changes for sizes 14 and 16 are in parentheses. Comparative measurements on page 71. And then they don't tell you. There's no schematics. There's no finished measurements. You are simply told that um, if you are, if you, you know, in order to fit into a size 12, <laughs> in order to fit into a size 12, you need to have a bust of 32. Yeah, sizing's changed just a little bit, hasn't it? A size 16 is a 36 inch bust. A size 20 is a 40 inch bust. So yeah, uh, that would not fit me. But um, yeah, really, I just, I love this collection of patterns. It is so wonderful to look through. And um, is there anything else I want to show you? I think that's probably, probably it. So sorry, the last video cut out a little too quickly because I was, um, didn't realize I was hitting the stop button, but I was pretty much done anyway. And for today's technique segment, I'm going to show you this yarn meter that I purchased recently. I'm going to go ahead and reset it. There's a little button up here at the top that lets you reset it. I bought this from uh, through Webs, but it's a uh, Nancy's Knit Knacks distributes these. It's called a yarn meter. And the whole idea is that you can, you clamp it to you know, the table that you use, same table that you use for winding yarn. So there's my ball winder and there's my Swift. So I have them all lined up, Swift first, then the yarn meter and the ball winder last. I'm not actually going to do yarn on the, on the Swift today, but that would normally be how you'd do it. The yarn would get put on the Swift and then you take the end, thread it through here and then you put it in this little slot here. Let's see if I can show you. And then there's a little place where you can clamp it down with this little lever. And then it also gets threaded through here and then threaded through your ball winder and put on the ball winder and then you wind it up. So, sorry, this is a little bit, I'm doing trying to do this handheld since I don't really have fancy equipment. Uh, but I'm just gonna use this little leftover ball of yarn, which is Sport Sock from Mustache They're in a retro rainbow color. I've obviously already knit something with this. And let's say, I mean, one of the things that I think this yarn meter is really good for is if you've got some leftover yarn and you're wondering exactly how much you have, you could put it on a kitchen scale like this one and weigh how many grams it has and figure out based on, okay, well, if it's a 400 yard skein that is 113 grams and I've got 20 grams left, you can do some basic algebra to figure out how many yards you have. Or you can run it through this yardage meter. Also great for hand spun or if you've lost the label on a yarn and you have absolutely no idea. <laughs> you, know, you can weigh it, but if you don't know how many yards are in a gram, then that doesn't really help you very much. So I thought this would be handy for, to have for all kinds of reasons. I'm just going to go ahead and see if I can do this with one hand, just kind of run the yarn through there. 
and through this little slot. And then you also, I can never seem to get this right. I'm just going to poke it through. Just kind of run it through that little slot right there. Okay. And then, you know, normally, like I say, you would, you would have have it on your, on your Swift as well, but we're just going to do it from the ball. Now, the next thing you have to do is that you've got to, I don't know if you can see those little teeth in there when I pull this lever up. Some teeth basically clamp the yarn down in there, and it's also what uh, reads the feet of yarn as you go through. Now notice it says that it's feet, not, um, not yards. So ultimately you'll have to divide this number by three to get the number of yards. But you basically just wind your ball of yarn like normal. Now they actually tell you in the instructions that you should tension it as much as possible. It's pretty well tensioned by gum. <laughs> I mean, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. And I've noticed, I've used this once before. See how it's already counting the feet. Um, the, the little clamps, if it gets stuck, this will, this little thing will pop down and release the yarn. I'm not quite sure why it does that, but you have to clamp it down again. Um, I also don't really quite know how to deal with the fact that by the time you get you get it all set up, there's probably about a foot of yarn that you've not even counted yet, maybe even more like two feet. I guess you can just kind of factor that in. But yeah, it just kind of counts up the yards as you go, or the feet really. All right, I had a little knot that went through there, but we'll just pretend like I'm not trying to be too accurate. Ah, crud. Got a little knot here, sorry. Always happens at the end of the ball, doesn't it? Okay, there we go. Okay, so according to this, and people have generally found this to be pretty accurate, um, this is 115 feet of yarn. And it actually stops as soon as the last bit goes through, the counting stops. So I would just divide this by three. It's, what, like about 33, 30, 38 yards of yarn. And, you know, I'm, I'll bet if I weighed this, like let's go over to the scale. This is 328 yards and 100 grams. So this should be a little over 10 grams. Oops. Zero that out. And sure enough, it's 12 grams. I'll bet if I did the math, that would be pretty much exactly right. So I really like using this. Um, the one thing that is a little awkward about it is that there's so much tension being put on the yarn. You know, the, the, the pulling it off of the, the Swift is one bit of tension, and then you've got more tension added here, and more added here, and more added here, and more added here, and it makes for an extremely tight ball. So you may, may remember in an earlier technique segment that I talked about winding off of a Swift twice. Wind once just to get it into a cake, and then wind again so that it's loose and not too stretched out. You really have to do that with this, because this just makes a super tight ball. But it's really great for giving you an accurate sense of how much yardage you actually have. All right, I, you can find me online as Dark Matter Knits everywhere, and my website is darkmatterknits.com. I will see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.